So everybody's talking about November the 3rd, who's going to win the election, and everybody says, well, this person's up, that person's up, we don't know how many's going to vote, we got all this, got all of that. A lot of people are saying if, I, if Trump wins, I'm leaving America, and some of them that are saying that, uh, I'm taking money for a, a charter plane. Because <laughs> if you don't like it, leave, you know, period. It, it, because some of these people that have become rock stars and idols of everybody else, they think that the world revolves around them. And so in this age and time, if you remember for quite a few years, there was a show that came out called American Idol. And out of American Idol, a lot of people uh, went on to become stars. Uh, Mandisa, uh, uh, Kelly Clarkson, um, who? Carrie Underwood, uh, the guy from uh, 10th Avenue North, uh, also uh, the, the uh, guy that's the leader of, of that, was on the one show um, that, that was there. And so you keep seeing all these people and they keep getting these record deals and all this stuff. America and Idol went away. And um, Simon Cowell is now like on TV everywhere around the world. They've got uh, Americans Got Talent, uh, The Voice, but that's Blake Shelton and, and uh, uh, Kelly Clarkson and... Uh, okay, see, y'all know who those people are. So you got that, you've got, uh, you've got Britons have talent, Japan has talent, Australia has talent, and they all got their shows, right? And then on Fox, you've got this thing called The Mask Singer, you, you know, which is kind of hilarious and the costumes and everything that they come out to sing and, and, and stuff. But anyway, on all of these, they, they, they all have a, especially like in The Mask Singer, they're, they're singing, they got a costume on, you hear the voice, and you've got to guess who you think it is. Well, and sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong, and it's you know, neither here nor there. But in, in Revelation chapter 1, verses 9, we're going to do 9 through 16 today. And, thanks, man. And so what it is, is in here, John starts talking about a voice that's going to occur, that's going to say something. And let me say this to you all, that this voice will not need a mask. This voice will be distinguishable. And when you hear it, you will know who it is. You have never, ever heard it before, but when you hear it, <laughs> you will recognize it for, for, for who it is. And so when you begin, uh, as we have been talking about, we as Christians, followers of Christ, born-again believers, whatever phrase you want to coin, I just call it a child of God. But one of the things is that we know as of, in the first four verses, it tells us that Jesus is coming in his return. He also tells us certain things are going to occur. And what he tells us, John says, or uh, Titus says in Titus 2.13, that we have this blessed hope. And there's a lot of people right now who are very dis dismayed. Their life, they're looking for hope. And they're trying to find it because of all the uncertainty and everything that's going on right now. It is, is this virus going away? Is it coming back up? What's going to happen now that we're coming into the winter and, and we're got, we got this and we got the flu season and we got all of these other things that are going. You, you know, how many people are going to die? Is it, go, is it going to be a pandemic and, and, and then spread on over into flu? And, and are kids going to be able to go back to school? How many businesses are going to close? Are we ever going to be able to eat like we used to be? And, and there's all of this uncertainty that, that is just causing such a, a, a turmoil in our lives, not just here, but all over the world that's going on. And everybody's trying to say, so what do we do? 
So one of the things that we, we did prior to this is we kind of introduced you to uh, Christ. And, and so stand with me, if you would, and let's read in Revelation chapter 1, and we'll just start with verses 9 through 12. And they'll have them on the screen, and so you can kind of read along with us, because if you remember, he says, he who hears these words and speak these words will be blessed. Okay? So here we go. He says, John, your, part, your brother and partner in the affliction. Y'all reading? Okay. Vocalize it. <laughs> I didn't say follow the bouncing ball. I said, let's read together. Okay? John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Verse 10, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet, saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, here's what I saw, seven golden lampsticks. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And Father, we just thank you because it is your voice, God, that is recognizable. And Lord, we just ask you today that as we come together, Father, that we recognize the voice of you. And more than anything, Father, may we follow that voice. May we pay heed and guidance to it. And Lord, we're going to give you the praise and the glory for it all. For we ask in the nice son Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. All right. So, what John starts out with in verse 9 is, if you remember in the writings of John, in the book of John, he never ever one time mentioned his name. He always said that I was the loved disciple. I was the one that Jesus loved. And he began to say he began to be known as what was called the beloved disciple. But what John was saying here is this. You got to remember all of the other disciples or apostles have already died. John is the only one left. And John starts out by saying that it not build himself up. He started out by saying, I, John, your brother and companion. He didn't say, I, John, the one that's going to be the orator of everything, the one that's going to be blessed with everything, the one that's going to get this revelation and see something that nobody else is going to see. That just wasn't him. All the way through, he's talking about his humility. And here's what he says. He says, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours, ours, not yours, not mine, Ours. Ours in what? In Jesus. So when you and I together, known as brothers and sisters in Christ, you need to understand something, and that is this. Every one of us are going to go through some trials and tribulations, some hard times, but they're not yours. They're ours. They're ours in Jesus. This is why Jesus says that whatever you're going through, take my burden. I've already proven that it can be done. You think your task is impossible? Okay, here. Here's what I want you to do. If you think your task is impossible, then what I want you to do is give your task to me and take mine. Because I've already proven it can be done. And if you don't think that yours can be done, give it to me and I'll show you that it can be done. 
This is why we always say, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me or gives me strength. I can't do it myself. You can't do it. And this is what John was beginning to tell us. When you begin to read in, in the, the, three, the three books of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, you'll also find that John was called in the church as the elder. He's the one that's been there the most and everything. In, in 2 John chapter 1, in, um, uh, in 3 John chapter 1, and he says, he looks them, he, he says, I am your Christian brother, companion, or co participant in the advancement of the kingdom. I'm right there with you guys that are suffering in all of these churches and all over that have already accepted Christ. Whatever you're going through, I'm right there with you. And one of the things that you need to understand is he, he's very um, choosy about the words that he uses. For instance, when he was talking about suffering, he chose the Greek word thelephis, which is T-H-L-I-P-I-S. And in there, what that word means is tribulations, trouble, or trials. And what this means is a lot of times we talk about suffering, but he's talking about tribulations. And tribulations gives, in, in the Greek, when you, when you were talking about it, it gives the, the connotation or the image of being pressed down, compressed, as to you have the suffering and the burdens, and what's happening is the weight of all of that is pushing on you. And what's happening is you are beginning to collapse under the weight of whatever it is that you are going through. So when he talks about suffering, he's talking about suffering bringing you down, not lifting you up. And this is why we understand that with tribulations and trials, it is something that a lot of times what we think weakens us. But in reality, what we need to understand is when we are suffering, we are suffering with Jesus, not meant to weaken us, but rather to strengthen us. And so he begins to start helping us to understand this because what he's talking about is John's vision of the voice. And we're talking about this voice that's there. You'll find these same words was used in Acts chapter 14 and verse number 22 was the message that Paul and Barnabas was talking about when they were being persecuted and placed into jail or prison. So what we end up understanding was John says that, that what we do when we're suffering these, this thalapa, thalapa is the lop, the lipus, the, the lipus. When we are suffering this delipus, that basically what is happening is we are learning how to, in, in, to be a part of a patient endurance of Jesus Christ. Because in the end, all of this, ladies and gentlemen, everything that we are experiencing, it will end. It will either end on this side of eternity or it will end when we enter into eternal life. And so what he's trying to tell us is that whatever we're enduring, we need to do it with patience. But so many times what happens is when we, when we hit these roads in, in these trials and these tribulations, when we should be patient, we're trying to say, Lord, would you please hurry up? How much more do I have to endure? Come on, Lord. If, if you ain't going to take the suffering from me, then go ahead and let, just call us all home. And especially in the, in the times that we're talking about right now. But Romans chapter 8 and verse number 17 says this. But if we are to share his glory, we must also 
share his suffering. And this is what many times as Christians we don't want to do. We love to share his glory. Love that all the time. Man, hey, Lord, you, you're, you're there. I know who you are and everything about you. And God, I just want you to be glorified in everything. And I want to share in your glory. But do I have to share in it by going through this? And he says, if you want to share in my glory, you've got to share in my suffering. You can't have the one without the other. It doesn't work that way. That is why Paul says, I count it a blessing to suffer with Christ. That's hard. It's hard when things are going on. But now we need to understand what John was saying. He says, I was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God in the testimony of Jesus. Here's why I'm here. You see, one of the things that a lot of people do not understand, and that is this. A lot of people believe that what John was, was John was on this, he, it was like a Gilligan's Island, you know, that he was kind of like the only one out there on there. Unfortunately, that is not true. The Isle of Patmos was basically like an Alcatraz. It was an island that they would, have, that they would basically put people on, and basically it was far enough away you couldn't get off. If you tried to get off of this island, it's done. But it was not a beautiful island. It basically was one of those islands that you see a lot around that is nothing but a, like a lot of rocks. And so what was happening in the, Roman, in the Roman Empire is that whenever somebody started an uprising or whatever, a rebel or, or trying to uh, protest against the government, they would be banished to Patmos. And basically, it was a big, huge rock quarry. And they would chip away at the rocks. And then they would take and put the rocks on the ships and take them back to Rome or some other part of the Roman Empire. So here's John, and he's out here, and he's doing this. And it wasn't for treason or espionage, which is what everybody else basically was guilty of. He was only guilty of one thing. That was the testimony of Jesus Christ. And yet he was put there. Now, what you understand is that John uses this word. He says the testimony of Jesus. And it's a very special word that he also used in the Greek and it, and it, and it, is, it is called Martys, M-A-R-T-Y-S. We have changed the word just a little bit, and we now call it martyrs. So he's saying that here it is, because of the testimony of Jesus Christ, I am a martyr. Because I'm being, you know, all of them have been martyred. They all died. And he says, and I know that I'm going to, I'm being punished, put to death because I was testifying about Jesus. That's my crime. That was the other's crime. May I say this to you? Many, many people around the world are being martyred for the cause of Christ. It still goes on today. It isn't something that just, you know, that just happened. But when you start talking about the testimony of Jesus Christ, you need to understand what's John talking about. Number one, when he was called as a witness, what did he witness? He, when he was walking with Jesus, he, walked, he, he witnessed the countless miracles of Jesus. Not only did he see his miracles, he also was a part where he saw John on the Mount, or saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Not only did we see him there, John was present as his crucifixion. How do we know? Because Jesus says to John, John, who we believe is a cousin of Jesus, not, not the uh, 
uh, James and John, the other John, but this one is the one who was a cousin of Jesus. And when Jesus said, woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. I can't take care of her anymore, John. And so therefore, being the oldest son, I am passing her over to you. She is now your responsibility to take care of. He didn't pass her over to, her, to his brothers, who later on became Christians. He passed her on over to her cousin, to his cousin, John, to say, take care of her. So he was there for that. He also was there when Jesus arose. He also was there with Jesus when he ascended. He also was there when Jesus, from his, when he arose and came back and met them, John was there. He was in the upper room when Jesus poured out his, his spirit as he had promised on the day of Pentecost. And so what we understand is what John was saying in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 2, he says, the life appeared. We've seen it. We testify. And they, he uses another word, of, of, a variation of the word martyr here in that testify. And he uses it as the word martyr with an E-O at the end of it. And he said, we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. And let me say this to you. What was true for John is very true for us today because the most breathtaking event, the most breathtaking occurrences that John had was when he met Jesus or when God through his Holy Spirit and through Jesus revealed something to John. I don't know about you, but the best moments of my life, you, you know, you, you've got, we've all got some of these moments, birthdays, marriages, anniversaries, whatever, these. But really the most breathtaking and monumental things is when you are alone with God reading the scripture, singing a song, walking down the street, and all of a sudden, he gives you a revelation. Brings out a verse that you've been reading and contemplating on and couldn't understand what it was saying, and then all of a sudden, it's just like, it just comes to you. And it's like, I don't care if it's raining, snowing. I don't care if everybody's honking. It's just like you're kind of oblivious to all of this because all you know is that God is speaking right now. In those moments, it's just like, wow. May I say to you, it's better than a sunrise in the morning. It's better than the sunset at night when God lays out something for you. You, those are unforgettable moments that he, that he begins to start talking about. But you need to also understand is that John had what, what they call a Patmos experience. And what a Patmos experience is this. It's a place where outwardly you're struggling, but inwardly, man, you just got all kinds of peace. It's okay, Lord. I, I know that it seems like everything around me is falling apart. Everything is crashing down on me. But you know what? I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, when, when you know, Diane and I were talking, you know, this week as things were going and we don't know what's going on and what's happening and, and you're sitting there trying to figure everything out and, and you're, you're saying, okay, what were you going to do? And I don't, I don't, un, don't know. But we'll be Okay. It would be all right because he said it would. And I said, you know, hey, we're getting old. <laughs> He's brought us this far. He ain't leaving us. You know, whatever it is, we'll get through it. 
you know, we, we've, done these, we've done these things before. And so sometimes we, we forget that it's all right. So what did John say? He said that while he was in the spirit, look at what he said. He said, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Now think about this for a minute. John's hearing this voice. And who's this the voice of? The, the voice of Jesus. Jesus is given the revelation. He's heard, let me say this to y'all. He's, he is very familiar with the voice of Jesus. Very familiar. And here's what he says. And I was in the spirit. And I heard a loud voice behind me. Like a trumpet. He's facing this way and behind him, he's hearing his voice. Let me say this to y'all. He's recognizing that voice, but it's a loud trumpet. And, and so he begins to start telling us, because you think about it, Jesus or, or John, about almost 70, 80 years prior, had been on a little boat out in the middle of the storm. And this one that he knew very well was sleeping. And they were tossing everything they could off that boat to lighten it up. They knew that that's the only way we're gonna get out of this thing. They're rowing, they're tossing and everything. And, and, and then they look around. We got an issue. We're doing all this work and he's sleeping. Master, will you wake up? We're going to crash. He stands up as only Jesus could do. He didn't say, fishy, fishy, welly, welly. He just said three words, peace, be still. And the Bible says that that water became just like glass. There was no ripple. It is as calm as calm could be. And he said, oh, she have little faith. John knew the voice that could calm the waters or the storms. John knew the voice that spoke to them when he came out of the garden or out, out of the grave. He knew that, and all of a sudden, he's hearing his voice, and he says, you know, because he, he had said that it's like the sound of rushing waters that, that's beginning to hinder. And, and it says, and I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. Listen, John could hear what was being said, but he wanted to turn around to see who was saying it. And a lot of times what you and I need to understand is this. There are times that we are hearing things, and ladies and gentlemen, we need to turn around to see who's saying it to us. Is that Jesus or is that someone else? So many times what we do is we hear voices and we just do it. I don't know about y'all, but it's like if I'm walking down the street and someone hollers out, Chuck. I'm turning around because I want to know who said it. Now, when I turn around and I look at that person, I may, I may not recognize them because they were hollering for somebody else. John, hearing his voice, he heard what was being said. He just wants to make sure, okay, I got it, yes. He's the one saying it. So I know that what he says to me is true because what we need to know is this. We will never truly be blessed by the what of God until we receive with humility the who of the voice of God. And there are so many times that people say, well, I'm a Christian, or um, I'm praying. Well, do you know God? No, but he, hears, he knows me. No, that's not the point. 
I understand he knows you. But the question is, do you know him? Because there is also someone else who hears prayers and is not God. It is Satan. And there are some times that he will plant these little traps in your mind. And if you're not careful, you will follow those little traps because you assume that this was from God. This is why Jesus was very plain when he said to try the spirit to see whether it be of God or not. If, if you're getting an answer to your, your prayer and it is contrary to what God would have said, I'd throw that one away. Because how do I know God? This is all I need right here. He defines himself, he tells me who he is, and he reveals himself in all of these things. Now, in these voices, or, or, or in here, you need to understand something, and this is what he was talking to John about, that, John, I'm going to give you something, and you will never, ever be the same again. And when Jesus speaks to us, ladies and gentlemen, we're never going to be the same again. Now, a lot of people will say, well, hold on a minute. This, how do we know about this Jesus? There's a, I, I keep telling you, I don't know how many of you all have read any of the works of a guy by the name of Flavius Josephus. Many times you'll just see um, a book out there. It's, it's just called the, the Book of Josephus. He wrote these things in, in the... He actually has a, a few books, and they're all condensed now, but they were written in smaller, smaller books, and they were actually called the Antiquities uh, of the Jews. And in there is one of the things that you need to understand. He actually wrote or lived or wrote during the period of time from 37 A.D. to 100 A.D., which means that he did not... He, when Jesus died, he was not writing. He was writing after Jesus, okay? That 63-year period of time after Jesus. But here's what he says. It is interesting to me, he, he says, um, that in addition to all that we read in the Word of God and, and, and all of these things, he says this, at roughly this, he, he says now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day as, he, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. This was not a writer from the Bible. This is a Jewish historian that's writing about Christ. So when they say, well, why do you believe these things? It isn't just because the Bible says so. There were people that were historians during this period of time that talked about the Christ, that talked about Jesus, recognized him as who, he who was foretold in, in the manuscripts of the Old Testament. And so when we begin to see these things, we need to understand something. And that is this. Paul writes in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse six, uh, 16, in the New Living Translation, he writes this. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. And he says how differently that we know him now. Used to, we would judge people by the way a human. He says, but what do I do? Now I know Jesus, I am more aware of people from his perspective. And sometimes we need to understand who he is. 
here's what John said. In, in, he said, and when I turned, I saw someone like a son of man. And when you begin to look uh, through the scriptures, you'll find this all of the time. And when he talks about the son of man, you need to understand something. He wasn't just talking about when I knew him. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7 and verse 13, Daniel writes, when, remember when the, the uh, uh, three Hebrew ch children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were thrown into the fire. And King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, had, had thrown them in there. And, and, and then they came in the morning and they looked in the fire and Nebuchadnezzar says, well, what's going on? And he says, you won't believe this. He said, didn't we, didn't we throw three men into the fire? And he says, yeah. He says, well, hey, take a look. They ain't dead. And the problem is they've multiplied. He says, because I see four in the fire, and the fourth one looks like one, like the Son of Man. And we begin to see, he says, that he also was the son of, of a man. Coming, he says, with the clouds of heaven. Daniel, Daniel also said that he was the ancient of days who gives authority, glory, and sovereign power so that all nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's his voice. And so when we begin to start looking and seeing, he begins to say, okay, let me describe who he is. He's, he's a voice that's eternal. The second thing that he began to say in um, John uh, chapter 1 in verse number 14, so if you'll give me that one, Mark, or I started with 11. Let, let's go from 11 to 14, okay? I think it's, no, 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 in Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, I read 9 through 12, so, all right, so where we go? Okay, I've read those, um, give me the next set real quick, okay, here we go. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe with a golden sash wrapped around his chest, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but look at what he said. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes were like a fiery flame. So when he talks about his white hair, he begins to start talking about white also being a thing of purity and wisdom. Not only do I hear his voice, which sounds like a trumpet, now let me start talking about his appearance. And part of his appearance, he says, it's, here's what I see. I see this man. His feet were like fine bronze as it, as it fired in a furnace. Sounds familiar? His voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. And what he was saying was this. He says, look, his eyes were like a blazing fire. You know what that means? He was looking straight through me, cleansing me. There's no secrets. He knows exactly who I am. He said he looked right through me. His feet were like bronze glowing in fire. His own wisdom and, and his holiness established his feet as the righteous. In Acts chapter 10, he says that he is a judging of the living and the dead. Wool, snow, fire are all reminiscent of Daniel. He is talking about him in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, where he talks about the ancients of day. His face like the sun shining in all of its brilliance in John, or, or in uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse number 16. Jesus is going back to the Mount of Transfiguration where there he saw Jesus in his glory once before on that Mount of Transfiguration when he saw Jesus being transfigured. He says, listen, it had also been a, a by David had seen it in 2 Samuel, Hosea, Malachi, Isaiah. 
John declared this, he says, in him was life, and that life was the light of man. In John chapter 1, verse number 4, Paul announced for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse number 6, and Jesus said this, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John chapter 8, in verse number 12, and so what Jesus is saying and what John is saying is I see the imminent, the, the, uh, I, I just see the light of his face. It's just breaking out the darkness. I can clearly see everything now. I'm well aware of what was there, but now I, I begin to start looking. And it says in verse number 16, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. It was not one of those little daggers that they would walk around with. It was a long, heavy sword. And again, I don't speak Greek. I have a hard time pronouncing English words. But the Greek word here in the, in, in, that he used was a word called rhomphia, which is R-H-O-N-P-H-A-I-A. And what it is, is the, it is the sword of a warrior. Jesus... He says, he's sharper than a double-edged sword, that it penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And you'll find that uh, Jesus will also use this in Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 15, where he says, from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. And this is the double-edged sword of God's judgment that is going to come upon this earth one day when he is going to once and finally judge what mankind did. We need to understand something, and that is this. Whenever you're talking to someone, there's a, a wise lesson in communication. When, when you say to someone that I value you, I value your opinion, it really matters to me. What we're saying to them is this. I've got my ears opened and I am listening to every word you're saying. I am listening, I am taking it in. I'm not thinking about anything else. I value you, I need you. And this is what John was saying with Jesus. And, and may, I, may I say this to you, is this. We've got to learn that we don't give value to someone. That's not in us to give value to someone. Instead, to listen to someone means that we are recognizing the value that they already have. And every one of us, please understand, God values you. And even though I may be the pastor of this church, even though I may have been, I have been saved now for 56 years, I still learn from little children who have just gotten saved. Because God has valued every one of you as his children. I don't bring value to you. God has already given you value in the kingdom. And what I've got to learn, what we've all got to learn is, okay, what value has God placed in you that I need to learn from you? And that's why I say to you all, don't ever let anybody tell you that you don't mean anything. I hear people all the time say, 
I, I'm nothing in the church. You know, I don't sing. I don't do this. I don't do that. Hold on a minute. Everybody in the family is important. They bring value. That's why God gives us the illustration that some are the fingers, some are the arms, some are the legs, some are the bones, some are the muscles, some are, some are the ears, some are this, some are that, that each of us bring value to all of us. I don't tell you that you're the toe. God has already made you the toe, and I recognize what that toe brings to the table is all of these. So, how am I doing? Not good. Um, I'll stop here and make this a double continuation for next week because I still got, I'm only halfway through this thing. I don't have any place to go. Okay. Um, You're the visitor. Does it mind to you? Okay, cool. If it doesn't bother you, then let's keep going, and I'll try to, I'll try to continue. Um, so he, here we go. So when he said, and I, I turned and I saw the seven, seven golden lamps, lamp stands, what he's talking about, again, you, you, the number seven, all the way through here is the number seven of completeness. And what does he say? Lamp stands, what were those? Those were the lamp stands of the ancient tabernacle, and guess what? They were golden. And the appearance of the blazing oil field things were, were a common sight that everybody would see. So what's happening is Jesus is explaining their mystery. He says, the seven lampstands that you're seeing, that you would have seen in there, he says, let me tell you what, what they are. He says, they are the seven churches. He was explaining what you're going to see now, I'm going to explain exactly what you're seeing. Okay, and he says these are the seven lampstands which represent the seven churches. Again, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And and those we'll catch when we go into uh, chapters two and chapter three. And and I hope you stay with me. If you're not with me, I hope you'll catch it on Facebook and go back and listen because what we're gonna do is show you how that those seven churches, a lot of times people will say that those are seven periods of church history. I believe that what God is teaching us is that those seven churches are, will, will take up your complete life as a Christian. And, a, and, and what point of life you are at right now is what God is saying to you. And, he, and what he's saying to you is this is what you need to do to get out of that period of your life to go to where it was that I first wanted you to go, to back to your first love. And so here we go. So he says, and I walked, I walked among the lampstands, and it says, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet. So what did he do? He was wearing the same robe that the high priests and kings would, would wear. But look at what he wore. He wore a golden sash around his chest. In Exodus chapter uh, 28, in verse number 5, God instructed Moses to have them to use gold, blue, purple, scarlet, yarn, and fine linen in the weaving of all of the sacred uh, garments. And Aaron was the very first high priest. But when this sash that was made entirely of gold was a pure reflection of the purification in the sacred ministry of Jesus. But there's a difference about this. His sash, it says he wore on his chest, most of the time, people would basically wear a, like a leather belt around their waist with a, with a common robe. But Jesus' robe, was. he says, I'm seeing him dressed like the high priest, but there's something different about him. He is wearing this, this golden sash across him. And that's why a lot of times, remember what we see in the pictures of Christ on Easter? What do we see? We see Jesus in a white robe with what? Because in the sight of men, purple was a sign of royalty. Okay? So they made, remember they made, they made the, the kind of like the purple sash 
type thing that they dressed him in to say, okay, yeah, he says he's a king. Let's just give him an outfit fit for a king with the crown of thorns and, and the purple sash. But when you, look at the, when you look at the pictures of Jesus, of a risen Jesus, what do they always show him with? A white robe and a golden sash. Why? Because this is the picture that John got of him when in the book of Revelation. This was a sign of a high priest, of royalty in, in there. And then he also says that it, that in his right hand, again, when you understand from the Old Testament that the place of power was always to the right. Remember when they were arguing about who could sit with Jesus in his kingdom? They didn't say who could sit on his left. They wanted to know who could sit on his right because this was the one of authority. And he, says, and he said this, he said he held uh, seven stars. And he, what were the seven stars? He said they were the angels of the seven churches. Now, these weren't physical, these weren't angels that you would see from heaven. What he's talking about is angels here. Is Angel is a what? A messenger. Absolutely. So what he's saying is the seven stars are the seven messengers of the seven churches. So basically what he's talking to is he's saying here, because he's going to write a letter to the seven churches, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to give the letter to the angel or the messenger of the church or to the pastor of the church or the leader of that church, and when I give them this, I am giving them directions as to what I see is happening in their church and what needs to be done. And this is why you you understand when we start talking about that when we do this, these aren't our words that we're speaking to you hoping that these are the words that God is saying to you through us that are there. And and so he entrusted them. But what does he do? We understand something, and that is this. Jesus is always asking us, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Can you hear me? Will you hear me? And what we need to understand this is we need to break through all of the noise of this earth right now because there is so much, have you ever tried to listen to a song when everybody else is singing? Or tried to listen to a song in the car when the kids won't shut up? You know? Or trying to watch, watch something on the news and, and there's all this other stuff and you're trying your best to f- filter it out? This is what God's saying when he's, this is what Jesus is saying, hear me. Here's what he's saying. And this is, again, why am I doing this? Because I believe this is what God is saying to us right now. There is so much external noise right now that we're hearing. Again, the pandemic, the death, the destruction, the election. Uh, Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Here's what's happening. Here's what's happening. And, And God's saying, listen, filter out this stuff and listen to what I'm trying to tell you that I've been trying to tell you all along, and that is this, I am coming. I won't tell you the day or the time, but you need to live every moment of your life as if this is your last moment. This pandemic has arisen a lot of things in the church. And a lot of people think, what are you talking about? Hold on a minute. Tell me what we could have done. We could pass out all kinds of of flyers and everything else. What could we have done to have reached roughly, uh, I, I think I'm up to 400 people now, 400 families. What could we have done? But you know what? God has brought 400 families to us. Why are they here? They're out of, they're out of food because they're unemployed. They don't have jobs. 
They don't know when they're going back to work. The unemployment has run out. Some of them may have no clue where their next meal's coming from. They're doing their best to get from day to day. They're not talking about storing up something for next month. They're talking about what can I, what can I cook for supper tonight? And what's happening? God is bringing them to us by letting us get out of the building. Get out of the building and get to the streets. Jesus did his best ministry, ladies and gentlemen, in the streets. Not in the church, not in the synagogue, but out there. So what did he do? He says, listen, here's what you need to understand. And and, uh, I have to stop. I'll continue the first part. It's only about 10 minutes, but I, I can't go any longer. You guys will get hungry and I won't, I'll lose you. But here's what I'm saying to y'all, and that is this. In all seriousness, if God was to speak to you right now, could you unequivocally say, I understand you and I read you out loud and clear? Or would you hesitate? The problem is most of the time we hesitate. Why? Because maybe it is God that's asking me to do something that I don't want to do. I'm not ready for this. Let me say this to you all. If God is ever asking you to do something, you are qualified to do it. He never asks you to do something that he has not qualified you to do first. Okay, now, which is the good part, he has never asked me to walk on water. I'm not qualified unless he shows me where all the rocks are. And if it's about two inches deep, you know. But there are things that I know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that's him. Because I know why. Because... If you go back and look at your life, let me say this to y'all. If you go back and look at your life, in certain times when you hit these moments in your life, you're going to find out, now I understand exactly why I went through that. Or you're out there and you're talking to somebody and all of a sudden a verse pops up and you have no clue where that verse came from. I heard that when I was a kid in Sunday school and I, I... and everybody thought I wasn't paying attention. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just brings it to my mind. God brings it to my lips. And everything else just follows from there. That's why I tell people when I meet you on the street, I have no pre-scripted messages. Because I have no idea what God wants me to say. I just know, okay, what is it that you want to say that this person, Lord. That's why it's very easy for me to talk to people because it isn't me talking. It's Him. And so if the words come out wrong, I blame it on Him. (laughs) You're the one that stopped me and told me to say it. (laughs) You know, and those weren't my thoughts, those were yours. So hey, so, so guess what? They're not going to be the wrong words. They'll be the right words. Just what that person needs at that moment. And I say to you tonight, today, have you heard him? Do you recognize him? He's given us a description of who he is. He is the Almighty. His name is Jesus. If you haven't met him, let's come meet him this morning, would you? If you have met him, maybe it's the time to meet him again. Say, you know what, Lord? I have not been doing what it is that you want me to do. We need to restart from this point. Going forward. I can't correct the past. That's gone.
we sure can correct the future and make it right. Or if you're here and you're not a member of this church and you'd like to come into this church by letter, by, by statement, by baptism, come on. This is your invitation right now. Come on. Let's stand as they sing. Forgiveness was born 